Hi friends, welcome. Today I want to share with you another photographer on this never-ending list of photographers. Today I'm sharing a photographer that I did not choose from merely my own desires and passions, but I had a little help. You see, I asked you guys to recommend photographers to me, and my buddy Cole obeyed me. Thank you, Cole. He recommended a guy named Tim McGurr, or 13th Witness, on Instagram. And I had never heard of this person before, and when I first started looking through his work, I thought, this is not quite my style, uh, but as I looked through his work, I started to become more and more interested in his process and his art, as I always do when I put these things together. <clears throat> I think everybody has something interesting about them to be said. He has a style that feels a little bit random and sporadic, not in a bad way, but I had trouble pinning him down. He is the son of Futura, which is a font, which I quite, quite enjoy, but also a famous graffiti artist. And this is good because I am i don't know how logistically one would be birthed from a font, and I imagine he would come out quite deformed. But anyway, let's talk about his photos. Thank you, Cole, for the recommendation. Okay. The first photo I want to take a look at today is an aerial shot of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. It is a rather invigorating photo. It is an aerial shot. It was taken, I assume, with a drone. More on that later. The arch is on the right-hand side of the frame, a little past the right third. And in terms of the horizontal dimension, it is in the center. So very exciting, very creative framing here. It would be interesting if it was in the center. But he did something unique here, and I like it. One thing that makes this photo really work is the lighting situation. It is absolutely perfect. The arch is lit up like a spotlight. I assume some clouds parted and the sun shined through. Evening light, probably. Maybe morning. This, you know, The light shines through onto the arch, and everything else around it is dark. The arch is very bright. This creates some wonderful contrast. The light is, is quite warm as well. We have all of the lines of the various roads converging on the arch, as they do in Paris, which adds some invigoration to the framing as well. Now, this photo was taken aerially, with a drone, I would assume. I mean, perhaps he was in a helicopter or some sort of, you know, flying machine that he invented himself, uh, like a, it's like a, it's like a jet engine macaroni uh, sculpture, <laughs> flying doodad. Um, I, I have no, I have no evidence to base this off of because, oh, look, he flew over. Wow. Sounds just like a helicopter. I have no evidence to base this off of because I don't think he's a macaroni sculpt, sculptist, but given his creativity with this framing, I'm trying to figure out a way to wrap this joke up, <laughs> given his creativity with this framing here, I would assume that he, you know, he's working on other things in other departments. <laughs> so... It was taken with a drone for demonstration purposes, right? A drone does not make a good photo. You do not make a compelling photo just because you can leap into the air. It is a way to create a compelling photo, but it is still, in fact, a tool. I think a lot of people got their drones when they first started becoming popular and got really excited about the stunning effects, but there's a difference in a stunning photo and a compelling photo. It is still a good idea to pursue mastery, and this is a great example of how those things come together. I've seen plenty of drone photos where they don't feel right, they don't feel balanced, they don't feel like there's a subject that makes any kind of sense, it's a photo of everything and nothing at the same time, it feels disorganized and I don't like it and it makes me cry. Next photo, this one was taken, I'm, I'm gonna assume in New York City, we have a highway running down the side of uh, some water, a river. And we have, once again, a very invigorating framing, similar to the last one in a lot of ways, where he's pushed the important parts of the scene over to the right-hand side, which is the cars going down this blue highway, bluish light. On the right-hand side of that light, we have some orange light. So we have some interesting sectioning going on, which I really enjoy. If we go from right to left, we have the orange section, 
the blue section that is the highway, and then the rest of the frame, the, the other two thirds roughly, which is a, um, dark water, and then we have a bridge in the background running all the way across from left to right. Quite beautiful lights, um, points of light across the bridge which make the bridge pronounce itself. And so this is an example of what you see in his work over and over, which is this very playful framing. He likes to try all sorts of different things that other people would maybe be a little bit scared to try if they're a bit more traditional in their thinking. He does it because it's fun. He, he tries to figure out which way he can, where he can stand and where he can orient the camera to make things work in a way that excites him, and I like that. This next photo is of a bridge. We are underneath the bridge directly. The bridge starts on top of us. It looks like a rather wide lens, perhaps. Bridge starts on top of us and shoots into the distance. We have some bridge pylons that help the bridge not fall on the photographer's head. This is a very lean composition, meaning there's not a lot of extraneous stuff going on. It's very balanced. It's very polished. This is a print that is sold on his site, even though when I went there, this print and all of his prints were actually sold out, and maybe that's a marketing tactic, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's like it's like the new thing for all the all the supreme kids to do is like list their prints and then list them as sold out immediately. Oh man, this guy's this guy's amazing. But prints tend to good prints, successful prints tend to be lean in their composition. They tend to feel very aesthetically measured and they tend to feel rather minimalistic. So if you're trying to sell a print a notoriously hard thing to do, but you have an audience, it can be done, of course, right? Then you want to be intentional about how you're framing photos to do that. You always want to think about the format that your photos are going to be displayed upon. We spoke about that in the previous video about Corey Arnold, where some of his photos go to magazines. So uh, there's a difference in a photo that goes to Instagram and a photo that goes to a magazine, although there are a lot of similarities as well. Next photo. This one was taken in some city location. I failed to obtain the location. We are underneath a bridge, looks like maybe a railway bridge. So one of those reminds me of like a Chicago-esque overground rail system. That's what I'm guessing we're, we're hanging out underneath today. We have some lights, that start, points of light that start near us and shoot into the distance. We have a couple of other sets of those lights, or really one set of those lights going down the left side, but not the right side, which is interesting and adds some organicness to the frame. But we have, once again, more sectioning going on, where on the left-hand side, we have some orange light from the street lights. On the right-hand side, we have some very blue light. Not sure where it's coming from. And then in the middle, we have the dark expanse of the bridge going over us with those points of light on top. So this photo feels neatly sectioned. And this is a great way to make your photos more exciting. Uh, there is patternicity going on here, meaning that there's a lot of repetition, which our brains enjoy, but there's also a lot of complexity. Like I said, there is uh, the lights on the left-hand side are mimicking the lights in the middle, but there's no, none of those lights on the right-hand side. So it makes the photo feel a little bit uh, exciting and different and, uh, you know, off balance if it was done improperly, but here I think it feels quite nice. On the left-hand side of the frame in the orange light, we have some different things going on, some cars and trees and such. Hard to work a new car, like a, a car made in the last 10 years into a photo, and it looks like there's some newer cars in this shot, so well done. They're quite shadowy and not pronounced, that's probably the reason why. But on the right side, we have some interesting industrial geometry going on. So the photo has some complexity to comp complement that patternicity, and it makes for a more invigorating, exciting, and loin uh, firing up composition. So I've never never made that particular sentence before in my life. That was That was invigorating in itself. So it's very stimulating and lively, this photo. In the next one, we have an aerial shot of a giant floating cartoon character. He appears to be wearing Mickey Mouse pants and shoes. He's basically Mickey Mouse from the waist down. And on top, he has a head made out of 
clouds and X's on his eyes. Perhaps he's dead. He also has other X's on his hands, which tells me that he had eyes on his hands. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but apparently this was an event because I saw another photographer take a photo of the same floating character. So it's some sort of installation. I thought that the photographer had removed, selectively removed color from the character because it is black and white and the rest of the world is in color. I did not realize that I, th I think it was actually designed to be that way and maybe designed to be a monotone character in a color world, which is kind of fun, when I saw the other photographer's photo and it was also black and white. So this is an aerial shot once again. There's a lot of mystery here. If you know exactly what's going on here, there's less mystery, but to me it's fun because there's a lot of mystery. It's very bizarre feeling. One thing that made this photo more interesting than it could have been if these elements were not worked together is the building, the, the skyline in the background contains a building that's much taller than the other buildings around it. If all the buildings were even, it would have been a less interesting photo by my estimation. This is a good way to, this, these are good things to think about when you're trying to develop your eye in photography. Look for little things that may seem in, insignificant when you're there, but can really make a significant difference in the end result of your photo and set you apart from other photographers. Uh, in this case, having that tall building uh, gives, our, gives our eyes something to grab onto and be pleased by. So he has the building in the background, a point of context might even help you know what city this is, although I've, I don't have enough information to know what city this is personally. I need to study my cities more obviously because I take pride in knowing what city I'm looking at by the buildings that I see. It's one of my, one of my nerdy obsessions. But uh, in the foreground, we have another point of context being the giant character. We have a tugboat floating around too, which I guess means the, the tugboat could have tugged the character into place. A really fun photo. In the next one, we have uh, an aerial shot pointing straight down onto some tracks at night, some uh, train tracks, passenger trains, I would assume. It looks like subway cars sitting along the train tracks. Could be a freight, freight train area, though. Not hard to tell. It's very dark. Now, I have, I have some observations of this photo. Some might call it a critique. Uh, one thing I don't like is that the edge of the photo, on the left-hand side, there is part of a train coming in, and it progressively leaves the frame as it goes up the side. But it, I, I would have gotten rid of that in post if it was me. I think it would have been nicer if that was gone and you had some black space on the edge. And he seems to be a bit more free with his framings. And that's okay. I, that's totally fine. It demonstrates that there are different things, there are different focus points in photography and in art that you can choose to emphasize or not and still have lovely art and compelling art and art that people care about. Uh, another thing that's interesting to me is I'm not quite sure what the subject is in this photo. I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to, supposed to be paying attention to. I obviously chose it because there's something about it I like, so that's a good sign. I think the geometry of the train tracks and having the trains scattered about is, is really fun, but I wish that the light, and obviously a little hard to control giant floodlights at night and and you know make a train a single train light up right but the floodlights are on some sort of work area some cars down there I, you know maybe there's a, a story that accompanies this that will help this out but it's emphasizing nothing to me and so i wanted to use this as an example to make us think about how we're composing things but this speaks to the fact that he seems to have a very playful approach to photography, and I certainly admire that. In the next one, we have a Formula One driver from two different angles. So we see here that he likes to work with a diversity of subject matter. This is much different than what we've seen so far, which tends to lean into urban exploration, that world. 
it seems that he's able to think in 3D space and move himself around without restriction. So this first shot is shooting through uh, the the railings of the car, I would assume, creating a subframing element, making the photo more exciting, uh, maybe getting rid of some parts of the photo that aren't that interesting and focusing in on the driver. We have the driver sitting there, his helmet, is, the visor on his helmet's all, almost down. Then we have another photo of the same driver. Looks like he's in the exact same position, but it was taken from the top, like directly overhead, just like the previous photo, aerial. Now, I don't think he used a drone for this photo. He's quite close to the driver's head, but it's a really exciting way to uh, create a photo story, right? Different angles, create more context, fun times. Now, uh, this speaks to the idea that a playful approach is sometimes a really good way to operate in a situation like this, where you have a lot of things probably happening at once. And if you were to lean on some of the things that you would traditionally lean on to take your photos, it w might put you in a position where the, your photos all end up looking kind of the same. You have to be able to maintain a creative mind in the midst of high-speed situations, such as potentially this one. Now, in preparing for this video slash podcast, I watched a couple of videos covering this Tim, and I noticed a couple of things. His body of work is kind of sporadic. It's all over the place. It, it, he takes photos of all sorts of different things. His approach is very playful. It's very, uh, very, I'm going to go out into the city today, and this is, I'm going to see what kind of fun stuff I can find over here. I'm going to go to this event and there's going to be a person there with like a mask on and I'm going to take a photo of them. It's explorative. It's childlike. And uh, I, it's not a bad thing. I think it's very interesting. I think it's one way to approach photography. And certainly it's been rather successful. I think he has 761,000 followers on Instagram. It's pure and explorative. He, uh, he photographs whatever he likes. This reminds me that when things in my life get all too serious sometimes, sometimes I need to just go out and explore. Whenever I explore with a camera, it taps into this part of me that I, um, that I have from when I was young, when I would run around in my backyard, when I would run into the woods and make up worlds. And I think we have to preserve that. It's very healthy. We also get other creative, uh, creative ideas from that. But it's also a really good idea to pursue to pursue challenge in your art, to push yourself and to have a cohesive narrative. But there are values to both things. There's nothing wrong with pursuing one or the other. Uh, I always preach about pursuing meaning on here. That's something that I care about. I want my photos to feel meaningful. I want them to actually potentially affect the thought, affect the minds of the people who see it. But there are different approaches. And a good example of a different approach is me and my wife just had a conversation with our friend Katie on our other podcast that we shared together. It's called Creating Things Together. I will link below to that. And Katie, when she takes photos for her Instagram feed, she, she is very passionate about environmentalism and uh, outdoor outdoors advocacy. And she, her feed is more about telling that story, sharing that message than it is about creating compelling photos. Sure, that's an aspect because that's a means to an end, but it's exactly that. It's a means to an end. That's different than how many photographers approach their work. That's in a lot of ways different than the way I, I approach my work. I start with one photo at a time and try to make it uh, be something that, that is brilliant to me, that I feel like is interesting, that I feel like is well composed, well thought out, and ha tells the story well. But you don't have to necessarily spend all of your time thinking about all the compositional fun things to tell a compelling story with a photo. I think it's important to remember that. You can focus on photography that merely feeds you, and that's fantastic, but know what that means for your work. You might feed yourself and 
in the end, if you don't focus on anything else, all you're going to do is feed yourself with your photography. And if that's, if that's your outlet for feeding yourself, fantastic. But you won't feed other people. And perhaps you need to find another area of your life where you'll feed other people with your work. Now, and when I, I want to be very specific when I say this, uh, when I say you won't f- feed other people. I'm not saying that, your wor- that people won't like your work. I'm saying that you won't intentionally feed them in a very specific way that you're trying to accomplish. There won't be a, uh, there won't be, you won't have an arrow that you're shooting directly at a specific target to accomplish that so that you will feed people in that specific way. I hope that makes sense. Now the next photo, we have a man holding a bicycle wheel in front of his face. Looks like nighttime light, some clouds in the sky behind him, some buildings around him. The wheel is in the foreground, out of focus. His face is in the mid-ground, in focus. He is wearing red, which contrasts well against the blue of the sky. This is a a technically quite good photo. However, this photo doesn't make my liver excited, if you will. But, as I was thinking about how this photo could be used, and, and this is a good thing to do because you can see something and instantly reject it, or you can try to be a bit more open-minded and see how it could be interesting, what it could be used for, and it will help you get into the mind, whoa, heavens, sorry, it'll help you get into the mind of the photographer. In this case, I think it would be a fantastic album cover, right? You crop it square, take off the top bit, and then you have the guy standing there with the wheel. It would be great for, you know, like, I'm thinking bluegrass, right? This guy, this guy is the best fiddle player in the world, and the bicycle wheel really doesn't mean anything. There's really no reason for it to be there. But you know what? It's hip and happening. It's fresh. It's real. It's uh, you know, it's what the young folk want, and whatever the young folk want is what drives society, and whatever drives society is what creates communism. In the next one, we are looking down onto what looks like some apartment buildings by night. An aerial shot. The apartment buildings make these rather interesting geometric shapes, unique stuff. If you're on the ground, you would not notice this. This is the power of an aerial shot. Uh, We have some repetition here as well. We have patterns. These buildings go off into the distance. So there's patterns and complexity once again. We have glowing light in between the buildings coming from the street lights, and then we have uh, some trees scattered about as well. The lights coming through the trees. Very pleasing. This is a this is a really wonderful feeling photo. Sometimes it's a good idea to change your perspective. Even if you don't have a drone, maybe you can hop up on, on top of one of these apartment buildings <laughs> if the law permits or if you're, if you're rogue. Uh, but even just standing up on top of something that gets you off the ground a little bit will allow you to see the world differently. In this case, like I said, you from the ground, this would look like just a bunch of apartment buildings all around. It's a normal thing for our minds to behold. But in this case, we we see how aesthetically beautiful these buildings are. In the next one, we are looking at the tail end of a yellow car in New York City. It is hard to take a good photo of a car, I've found. Even though they can be very aesthetically pleasing, particularly if they're older cars, I found that you will take the photo and more times than not will say, this is far less interesting than what I experienced when I was there. I was kind of blown away by the glory of it all. And then you go, you go back into Lightroom and you start trying to make it work and it just doesn't make any sense. In this case, he was able to accomplish an interesting photo of a car. There are a couple of ways he did this. One thing I, I think really helps out is the dynamic angle. It looks like he maybe crouched down behind the car uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at the tail end of the car from a very pleasing angle, and the car is sort of diagonal to us. In the background, we have the city. He added that context. There's also a dynamic contrast here between the yellow car and the blue skyline in the background. It's raining. It's a rather moody, rainy day. And this rain adds energy, resting on the the window of the car rolling down and on the various contours of the car. There's interesting layering and sectioning happening here too, where the car is clearly pronounced as the subject. It's very close to us. It's very bright. And as we move into the background, we have a couple of subframing buildings, very shadowy buildings. 
and then a sliver of the New York City skyline in the distance, and we only see a little bit of it, removing all of that extra fat in the composition is a good way to make a photo more exciting. Um, I heard Ted Forbes say the other day, when it comes to framing up a, a, a good photo, a lot of times it's not so much about what you put in the photo, it's about what you leave out. So we have the Freedom Tower in the background with the fog resting over the top of it, and it's a, it's a really lovely photo. Well done, very dynamic, very complex, really. In the next one, we have some rather different subject matter than what we've been looking at so far. We have an overwhelmingly orange sky, a sunset, and then we have hot air balloons floating around. Many of them, I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 balloons. So we have a shift of subject matter, which speaks to what I was mentioning a second ago, which is his playfulness, his ability and desire to shoot very, various different things in an explorative manner. This photo feels very organic. It's, it's poetically random. Now, in order to achieve a poetically random feeling photo, it's a good idea to still group things together, find cohesiveness, but allow for discohesion to occur. And we see that here, where we have various groupings of balloons, but they're not quite defined. They're a little messy in a really wonderful way. That's an art form in itself. This demonstrates wabi-sabi, which is the, a principle in Japanese aesthetics, and it's about the beauty of imperfection. It's about allowing imperfections into your art and how that speaks to the humanity of us. And it demonstrates how beautiful humanity is. It allows humanity to be expressed as opposed to making things feel uh, overly spot cleaned until there's, there's nothing real and authentic feeling in them at all. That's always a, an interesting balance. In the next one, we see more hot air balloons, but there's a different approach being taken advantage of here. The force at play in this photo is the singular subject. In the last one, it was a plethora of balloons floating about. It was a photo about a feeling, an environment. This one is a photo about a single balloon with some other balloons around it. What sets that balloon apart is the giant flame shooting up into the balloon, creating light and separating it for our eyes. We see a wonderful contrast of warm against cold, but you see his you see the creativity in his approaches. You see that he's able to open-mindedly shift from from one way of um, capturing a specific event to another way. At ease, boys. The is that a from a thing? At ease, boys. Is that what they say? Yeah, that's what they say to army men after they they've been standing there and stiff. Sir, yes, sir. And then they say, at ease, boys, and then they can rest and go take a nap. Hmm. I don't take naps. I'm not a napper. I kind of can't. My brain won't let me. Are you a napper or are you not a napper? I would love to know. It's very important. I'm taking, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing like a scientific expedition, if you will, to set apart nappers from non-nappers. And the purpose of this is communism. In the next one, we have another aerial shot of some train tracks with some passenger trains pointing straight down, uh, very similar to the previous one of this sort, but different in a lot of ways as well. This one was taken in the day. It was taken from a closer uh, perspective. The drone was lower in terms of altitude. The train tracks are mostly covered with trains from head to toe in this photo, but there are a couple of ones on the right. Two of them with trains going halfway down and then two of them completely empty. If he had taken a photo of train tracks where all of the train, uh, all of the tracks were occupied, you would not have the effect here, which is that the empty tracks break things up. It makes the photo more aesthetically intriguing. If you have too much patternicity, you end up with a photo that it's a little bit overwhelming to the senses. 
you want to be able to break things up, right? On top of the train, you want to have a person wearing red laying down, spreading eagle, for example, or you want to have some train tracks that aren't full of trains. The edges here are quite nice. You redeemed yourself, Tim. In the next one, we have a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge, also an aerial angle. We have an interesting red-blue play happening here. A lot of the scene is blue with the water and the sky. We also have some interesting browns going on in the distance on the mountains. And of course, the Golden Gate Bridge is very red, or I guess maybe burgundy, if you will. Golden? It's not golden. Why'd they call it that? The Burgundy Gate Bridge. Oh, that's why. <laughs> we have a high angle. We have the leading line of the bridge itself starting close to us on the bottom of the frame shooting out until it connects to the tower of the bridge. And we have a nice landing point for our eye, which is the tower. It is mm, basically the brightest point in the frame. It acts as the subject. It gives the photo a nice hierarchy. That's the beginning of the hierarchy, and as we move through, we move into the other parts of the image. The bridge being, the top of the bridge being just below the mountain, I think is very helpful here, as opposed to going uh, clashing with the top of the mountain or going above, I'm getting technical at this point, but going above the mountain, I think that that would have been tougher to make that work well. Uh, bridge, I'm reading my notes, I'm trying to figure out what the heck I'm talking about here. Where the bridge ends up, is, please. Okay, yeah, so another thing that makes this photo interesting is where the bridge ends up. It's connected to a giant landmass. You see more development. It, it tells a story. We don't often see the bridge portrayed from this angle. We don't normally see, I mean, we see where it's going, right? But we don't see what it is that it's going to. And I think that was a, a really clever way to set up this photo. It feels very anchored, right? If you picked up this photo and dropped it on the ground, would it fall over? <laughs> the way he made this makes it feel like it would fall in balance. And um, I love when I find photos like that. He did that well here. Next, we have a photo taken in some sort of eating establishment. We have a woman handing us some food. She has a slight smile on her face. Once again, we have a dramatic shift of subject matter. This is a bit more of an environmental portrait. Also, sort of a documentation of his day. He was about to receive his food, I suppose, from this friendly looking woman. I think it's a good place to start in photography, documenting your day. If you can't quite figure out what you want your photos to be, about, to be about, go out and look for what happens in your day. Look for the things that make your day interesting. Try to find a way to document those things. Also, go make your day more interesting so that you can document it. But this is a good way to find subject matter for yourself. And especially on Instagram, people like to connect with the artists. So if you could take a photo and put a lovely message beneath that photo, I got this hoagie and it was the best hoagie I've had in my life. And I, one day I wanna have children. <laughs> I mean, it'll be a little bit of a dramatic shift to go straight into the children issue, but you know what, it's real, it's authentic. Uh, if you want people to feel more connected to you, document your day. In the next one, we have an aerial shot from quite high of a bridge to Highways, I assume going one way and another, side by side, parallel. And he has done an interesting thing here. It's a clever concept where he turned the drone to where the bridge runs diagonal as opposed to straight up and down or straight horizontal. It starts on one corner of the frame and makes its way down to the bottom corner on the opposite side of the frame. And I think that was very clever. In the next one, another clever concept, we're in an underground train transportation tunnel, subway or tube or whatever you want to call it. There's a train coming by. The only light in the scene roughly is from that train. The train is merely a schmear in the scene. It's going by so fast and he drug his shutter. It's a blurry train. It looks quite aesthetically wonderful. The train is going down an adjacent track to the one he is standing on, so he is in no immediate danger, although potentially in some unimmediate danger if another train comes. This reminds me of my favorite documentary, which is called Undercity, and it's by the filmmaker's guy named Andrew Wonder. 
and he followed this guy into an explorer type into the the um, underground subway tunnels in New York City, and they got themselves into a bit of danger, and it makes your heart race. I would encourage you to check it out. I'll try to remember the link below to that. I'm sorry if I don't, but a great photo, clever concept once again. This last photo is one of my favorites of his. We have someone playing basketball. It's an aerial shot. We are pointing down onto the person. It's a rather exhilarating composition. It looks like it was taken in morning or evening light. We have long shadows. There are lines flying around, basketball court markings. The person is halfway between the ground and the net. He is going in for a dunk. There's one thing that makes me loony about this photo, and that is the right edge. There is a point where one of the painted circles comes into the frame, and I would have cropped that out. But that's okay. It's still a fine photo. Uh, There are a lot of vibes flying around in this photo that I, I really love. One is the importance of practice, the importance of dedication. The way he shot this makes the person look quite small as opposed to looking heroic. If he was on the ground, taking a photo of the person flying through the air, down low, you would have a heroic looking uh, sports ball player, which people like to do. Nothing wrong with that. In this case, the person is very small. We're looking down, which to me emphasizes the importance of dedication and growth. This would be a good photo to attach a story to. Like if you're scrolling through Instagram and you see that this person has, he's been playing basketball for 90 years. He's 91 years old, and he's been practicing this specific motion, this specific shot, I don't know basketball terms, dunk, over and over since he was one. And boy, has he gotten a little better, but he's too short, so he'll never be in the NBA. So be intentional about what you're communicating with your photos. Okay, in conclusion, in Tim, we have a very playful and explorative photographer. This is an emphasis in his photography, which I think is important to remember. It's, you want to remember to make photography fun for yourself, to continue to explore the world, know that there is more to explore in the world, and you can communicate that with other people. His work is focused on him. It's focused on the photographer as opposed to focused outwardly. Like if we look at the work of a Steve McCurry, it is focused on his subject matter. It is focused on the people he's documenting, the cultures he's documenting. In this case, these photos seem to be more about Tim, which I think is also perfectly fine. So what I would say is it's easy to lean one way or another as a beginning photographer especially and all throughout your photography progression you're going to naturally go one way or the other now the question is do you want to go that way I naturally will go an explorative route I think but I've had to choose to in my mind be more than that I want my photos to not just be about me and my exploration. I want them to tell a specific story. So define your terms of engagement. What are you trying to do? What's your message? Question yourself. Think deeply when you're showering, you know, when you're alone, when you have to poop. Go sit down. Just think about what you're trying to say with your work. Why does my work matter? Why does anybody care? (laughs) And these are like, seem like existential, depressing things to think about, but they don't have to be. They're important. Good artists do this. So, thank you so much, Cole, for recommending uh, Tim to me. It was fun to study him. I will link below to his things. I encourage you to check him out. Uh, Recommendations from you other folks. Be like Cole. Tell me who you would like me to talk about. If you like this video, it will let me know that you appreciated what I was up to, and that means a lot. And if you subscribe, that makes you a neat person. That's it. I hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye.